Hope you've been enjoying our series called God's Generals, the Healing Evangelist. And I think I've saved the best one for last. At least I know this, she is my favorite. Because as a little boy, I had the privilege of meeting her in two of her services. I had the privilege of sitting in the top of the Maybe Center in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and seeing Miss Kuhlman on the platform as she walked out on her white dress, and she began walking about an hour and a half into the service, she began to cry, and all of a sudden, I begin to see nuns come out of wheelchairs and walk off down the aisle like we get up out of a chair, having no physical problem, just jump up and walk off. All of a sudden, about three rows from me, down in the section where I was seated, there was a woman that was blind in an eye, begin to scream at the top of her lungs, I can see, and Miss Coleman said, well, come down and tell us what you can see. And I remember the woman with her friend getting down the stairs and walking all the way down to the pulpit area, which was like, you know, three flights down to get down there. And I remember her testifying. And I, remember I sat there for about four and a half hours as a little boy, just mem mesmerized at what was going on, what I felt, what I saw saw, what I was hearing. It was one of the most phenomenal meetings in my life. I'll never forget when I began my study on God's generals, as I began to try to find books and different things of Miss Kuhlman, I began to find people who was in her services, who worked as ushers in her meetings, and I also found people who knew her personally. And they all had one thing in common, such a loyalty that I've never found in any ministerial staff, as I found those who worked for Miss Kuhlman and those who were not so much a paid staff, but worked for her in her meetings as an usher or some type of book table attendant or something. To this day, they'll defend Miss Kuhlman. To this day, you do not dare say one negative thing about Catherine Kuhlman, or they'll come alive and tell you the facts and tell you to be quiet and, and tell you not to criticize one of God's great servants. Catherine Kuhlman's life began in a small Midwestern town in Missouri called Concordia. I had the privilege a few years ago, I was preaching not far from there, and I decided to go in a little bit earlier on my flight to go to the little small town of Concordia. Catherine Kuhlman called it a crossroads town. Well, if you blink twice, you've missed the whole town. That's how big it was. Her father was mayor of this town for several years, and it was in this town at the Methodist Church where Catherine Kuhlman was born again. She did not have a born-again experience, maybe as you or I, that said a prayer with someone who led us in a prayer. She was on the back row of this church as they were singing the last hymn of that particular service. And all of a sudden, she said the power of God came on her to the point that she began to cry, to the point where she began to shake to the point she had to put the hymnal down. She didn't know what to do, she said. So she said the only thing she knew to do with the anointing of God on her, and she's shaking under that anointing, she stepped out from that pew, from the back row, and walked all the way to the front and knelt down by the altar. And all the ladies of the church, she said, or the ones that were close by her, stepped out from their seat and came down and tried to comfort Miss Kuhlman. She said they were telling me that everything would be okay, but there was nothing wrong. She had been such a good little girl, one told her, and she, Catherine Kuhlman says, Jolene, she knew that I was the most mischievous girl in town. She said, they didn't understand that that day I accepted Christ as my Savior. She said, when I left that service that afternoon, and walked home uh, to see my father. And her father was one of the greatest influences in her life. She loved her father. Her mother was the one that did all the discipline in the house, but father was the one that seemed to do all the comforting in her life. And so when her father passed away, and she took the love she had for her natural father, I believe, and was able to relay that to the Father God in heaven. And that's why there was such a beautiful relationship that you could almost see visually on the stages of her miracle services as she talked about her Father God and her best friend, the Holy Spirit. Catherine Kuhlman went home that day and she said the sky would seem bluer, the birds seemed a little bit louder in their singing, everything looked brighter. She went to her father and jumped into his lap, she said, and put her arms around his neck and says, Father, I, I, I found the Lord today. And all he said was, well, that's good, Catherine. Catherine never would ever know if her father understood what happened to her that day. In fact, later in life, she got a phone call when she was passionate in Denver, Colorado, and she said the phone message was that her father was dying, come home quickly. Catherine jumped in her car and was driving through a blizzard through Kansas to get back to Missouri and barely got there. And when she got there, her father had already slipped into eternity. She had stated throughout her life she did not know that if her father ever was born again or not, but she had a hope within her that she'd see him one day in heaven. Kevin Kuhlman never finished high school. 
Her sister had married a, a traveling evangelist by the name of Parrot, and uh, they traveled around, and Catherine uh, was able to travel with them and help take care of the children. But as they began to find out that the money that came in from the traveling preaching meetings was enough to support the man, the woman, and the children, and Catherine Kuhlman to help care of all the things with the family. So instead of going back home, Miss Kuhlman decided that she would travel and preach on her own. She found her a pianist that would go with her and believed in her. She was a young girl, very tall. And she began preaching in the state of Idaho, down into Nevada, into Missouri, different places in the Midwest, and then out on the West Coast a little bit. And she began to preach. She didn't have big crowds. She didn't know very much, she said. She said all that she knew was salvation, so many times she would almost lock the doors to make sure everybody got saved. And even when the ones that said they were saved, she wanted them to get saved again to make sure they were saved. She said that she how many times had to sleep and like in chicken houses and barns. She didn't have the money for the hotel. The people wouldn't put, them in the, put her in the home. So the beginning of Miss Kuhlman's ministry kind of does not fit the picture that maybe you and I have of Miss Kuhlman now, of a young teenage preacher, a young teenage single lady preacher traveling around. She wound up in the beautiful city of Denver, Colorado. She got there was just to hold a few days meetings. 400 people showed up. There was such an outbreak of people getting saved and people loving her. They said, uh, Miss Kuhlman, Kuhlman, would you stay? Would you stay? She never stayed for several years and building a church of over 2,000 people. Catherine Kuhlman, I'd have to say, to build a 2,000 member church in Denver, Colorado, even today sometimes is a challenge, but back then it was even more. She had a 70 foot uh, sign on top of her roof that blinked uh, different messages to people that drove by her church. She became one of the most influential people at that time in Denver, Colorado. What we have found for you is something that I know really needs no explanation. We have found some film footage of Miss Kuhlman and one of her miracle services in Anaheim, California. And before I go on and tell you the rest of her story, I'd like to take this time and let you go into a miracle service for yourself at an Anaheim Convention Center in Southern California. Not a man, not a woman, not a child in this place of worship shall see thy servant. Move upon this paper. I pray to the Holy Spirit that you'll have perfect liberty in this place. Oh, for a thousand tongues. To tell what we have experienced, what we feel, what we know to be the truth. <laughs> but may the Holy Spirit come upon this people and give us great spiritual revelation as we wait in your presence. Let me for just one minute check the sound before our Jimmy sings because I want you to get every word. How many cannot hear in the auditorium say amen? Well, how do you know what I said? <laughs> Let me see again. There's just a section up there. Okay. I, I, now they're scared to death to say anything, you know what? Is it just one section up there? Can you hear now? One person has good hearing up there. I'll have to pray for the rest of them after the service, you know that? <laughs> well, I'll tell you, I don't care whether they hear me or not, just so you feel the presence of the Holy Spirit, you know, and it's just like that. Donald would be here. You knew Jimmy would be here. And I'll tell you confidentially, I haven't seen Jimmy yet. I have told Jimmy over and over again, I've, I've said, Jimmy, if I have a heart attack, you're the one who's going to give it to me because you always come on the last plane, or you, Jimmy always does. Now, I, I, I'll tell you, and you can stake your life on it. When we have the rapture, Jimmy's going to be the last one up. <laughs> There's something about 
uh, Jimmy, he always takes the last plane, but never worry about him making heaven. He may be just a little late, but he'll make it. And here he is, Jimmy McDonald. Where are you, Jimmy?
everybody's talking about the hour, of course, in which we are living. The uncertainty of the future is on the lips of men and women everywhere. I don't care where you go. West Coast, East Coast. I don't care where you are in the world. I don't know whether the man, whether he be a politician or just the businessman or the man on the street. I don't care who the person is. On his lips and in his mind is the uncertainty of the future. If you really want to know what the future holds, then, my friend, turn to the Word of God. It's all in the Word. We're the place where the world is standing on the threshold of the greatest suffering it has ever known. The Bible speaks of it as not only troubles, but tribulation. Tribulation of the world has never known, no generation has ever known the suffering, the tribulation that's just in the future. It's happening that quickly. Nations or as men on a chessboard. This is the hour when God has described it as having hooks in the jaws of the nation. There is no greater, really great world ruler on the scene. But if you want to know how the nations are going to shape up for that lost and grand and fatal battle. All you have to do is to read the 38th chapter of the book of the Revelation. It's all there. It is no secret. If some of you reporters want a real scoop, start reading the Bible. It's there. The whole thing is there. And this generation shall not pass away until all these things be fulfilled. I'm not a seer, I'm not a prophet, a prophet but I believe the word of God. And I'd stake my very life on it. It's dark out there. The only restraining force that's left in the world today for good is the power of the Holy Spirit. That's the only restraining power there is. And I don't want to be here one five minutes after the, the Holy Spirit has been taken. I tell you, my brethren, I wouldn't want to be here one five minutes after the Holy Ghost has been taken out. He is the only restraining force in this world today. All the forces of hell are loose. And think what it's going to be like when the Holy Spirit is taken out. When Jesus Christ came to this earth in the form of flesh, he staked everything on this mighty third person of Trinity. I mean everything. Because he knew he would be as much man as though he were not God. He knew he would stand face to face with temptation. He knew the hour would come when he'd stand face to face with the evil one, the devil. And before he went away, the very last thing that he did, he made provision that you and I should not be defeated on a single score. If you're a part of this great body of believers, you do not have to go down in defeat for one split second. I do not have to go down in defeat for one split second. Heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ Jesus in this great auditorium. Greater is he that is within us than he that is in the world. Hallelujah. Do you know of that wonderful fellowship of the Holy Spirit? Do you really know?
know what it means. Oh, I know there's that great ecstasy of being filled with the Holy Spirit. I know we're in a great charismatic world convention here today. You'll have great moments of ecstasy. And there'll never be a greater experience of emotion in your life than when you receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That's marvelous. But my friend, do you know the experience of having yielded your will to the will of the Father? Not some of self and some of thee, but none of self and all of me. I feel that glorious anointing of the Holy Ghost, that provision that he has made for every one of his children. When he'll take the most ordinary, he doesn't ask for golden vessels. He doesn't ask for silver vessels. He asks for yielded vessels. Glory to God. And he'll take the most ordinary person. I don't care who that one might be. He'll give you a wisdom beyond the wisdom of man's understanding. He'll give you a courage. He'll give you power. Where you can feel you can stand alone. Arrayed against all the forces of hell. And you stand there strengthened. And you feel like a giant, not to be called of their own strength, but because you're drawing on unseen resources. I haven't been speaking to you about something that's imaginary. I've been speaking to you about something that's the most real thing that can happen to any individual. You wonder why this great coming out among the Catholics, the Protestants, they're coming out the non-believers. They're coming out from every nation. Something is happening. Something is happening. I pray that before this great convention is over with, You'll come to the full revelation that something is happening. Something glorious is happening that all the forces of a hell will not be able to stop it. I don't care what your unbelief may be. I don't care what your theology may be. I want to go on record as saying to you, all the forces of hell will not stop this great outpouring of the Holy Ghost. There's no one quite like Catherine Kuhlman. In 1937, while she was still pastoring her Denver church, she had many guest speakers come through, men like Raymond T. Ritchie, other great speakers that were the leading the charismatic or the Pentecostal renewal in those particular days. But there came a man from Texas named Waltrip whom she fell in love with while he was still married to his first wife, but she did not know that because Walt Tripp and her. They were divorced. Walt Tripp and his wife was divorced and left the children behind and came up, and Captain Kuhlman and Mr. Walt Tripp were married in Iowa. This was the great secret of Miss Kuhlman's life and her great mistake. She told the church there in Denver she was going to get married. All of her friends, even preachers from around the country that heard the news, called and begged her, you're making a mistake, Captain. Don't do it. Don't do it. She went ahead and did it. She went over to Iowa, and they were being married. Right in the middle of the marriage ceremony, Catherine Kuhlman fainted 
I wish that she would just stayed out for a little bit longer and come back saying, I've come to my senses and I'm not going to marry you. But she recovered and went ahead and married Mr. Waltrip. The story goes as they were finishing all the, the wedding ceremonies and all the cake and all the things that goes with, with the wedding. They drove back to the hotel to change clothes to go on their trip. And she jumped out of the car before her, newly, her new husband could turn off the, the key of the car and turn the car off. She ran to her friend's room crying, I've made a mistake, I've made a mistake. And then banged on the door and they opened up and he took Catherine away from her call and her destiny for eight years. They eventually ended up in Los Angeles, California, where at different times she'd visit Sister McPherson's church. But then there came a time in her life where she felt like she could no, go no longer. She could not live with Mr. Waltrip and obey the call of God. She was between two. Many times, the few places where people would see the team, Catherine Kuhlman would sit on the platform and she would cry. Some thought it was the anointing on her life or the anointing that was on, on the meeting that made her cry like that. But really what it was that she was crying because she knew she had missed God. She tells the story that she walked to a dead-end street in Los Angeles, California, and she calls it the day that Catherine Kuhlman died. The day she looked up to God and said, I've done I've done everything I can do. I can do no more. All I have left in my life is my love for you. If you can use my love, then please use it. Catherine Kuhlman left that day, left her husband, separated from him, went to, Cal went to Pennsylvania, to a city called Franklin was where she ended up. People loved her there. She went on the radio with her radio show called Smiling Through. Then eventually, she moved to Pittsburgh after an interesting event. One of her friends called Maggie Hartner that became her lifetime secretary said, Catherine, why don't you leave Franklin and move to Pittsburgh? She said, I can't do that. These people have been good to me and faithful to me. I can't leave them. She said, I'll only leave if the roof of my church falls in. Well, that night, a snow uh, came and the snow got on top of the roof of the church so heavy that the roof of her church fell in and she moved from Frank Franklin, Pennsylvania to Pittsburgh where she spent the rest of her life and where her headquarters were. She became one of the most popular citizens of Pittsburgh, greatly loved by many people there except for some of the pastors in the beginning. She began to pack out the auditoriums that she spoke there in Pittsburgh. People stood for hours outside trying to get in. Miss Coleman began to have a healing ministry. Her healing ministry began as she began to talk about the person of the Holy Spirit. When she began this series in her church up there in Pennsylvania, she began to talk about her friend, the Holy Spirit, how wonderful he is, how great he is that Jesus sent him. And one night, a lady raised her and said, Miss Coleman, can I give a testimony? And Miss Coleman said, sure, give a test. She said, last night, while you were speaking, the tumor that I've had trouble with disappeared while you're speaking. I went to the doctor, and here's the report. Then another man on the other side raised his hand and said, Miss Coleman, I have a testimony. I've been legally blind for 22 years, and last night while you were speaking, my eyesight came back, and I went to the doctor today and see as good as you can. I have 20-20 vision. This is the way the miracle ministry of Catherine Coleman began. She didn't want to touch anybody in her miracle services. She wanted them to be healed first by God. That way, they knew it came from God and not by her. And then after they were healed, she asked them to come up on the platform and give a testimony to all the people of what God had done for them and give God the glory. And many of you have been in those miracle services and seen the hundreds that tried to get to the platform that were healed in those miracle services that went to four to five hours. We have another great clip we want to give to you. This is a clip of her toward the end of her life in the Jerusalem Holy Spirit meeting. You can tell by the way she is that her, she is not feeling well. Sickness of her enlarged heart has begun to affect her physically, but still you can see uh, her story as she tells it, and you can see her love for people, and some of the miracles that begin to happen as the Europeans and the Arab community and the Jewish community came together for that wonderful meeting there in Jerusalem. I give you praise. I give you praise. I give you praise. It costs much, but it's worth the cost. It costs everything. If you really want to know the price. I'll tell you, it'll cost you everything. Catherine Kuhlman died a long time ago. I know the day, I know the hour, I can go to the spot 
where Catherine Coombs died. But you see, for me, it was easy. Because I had nothing. I had nothing. Which leg, honey? Which leg? From the feet. So flat that I in this. Oh, Stop down on it. You could now. I can't do that. Right? 
Did you think something might happen to your daddy? Yeah. Are you happy? Yeah. Turn around and tell the people how happy you are. Tell them. Tell them. Tell them. You, you just can't talk. Dear Jesus, the power of the Holy Ghost just goes through her body. Let her go. The power of God goes through her body. The glory that's on this man. This man is getting something more, I'll tell you. He's getting something. Keep seated. That is the power of the Holy Ghost. I want to explain something to you very, very quickly before I enter into a little heart to heart talk. I want you to know that I have seen literally thousands and thousands slain by the power of the Holy Spirit. And to this very hour, I do not understand the slain power of the Holy Ghost. One thing I do know, and that is that Catherine Pullman has nothing to do with the slain power of the Holy Spirit. Please believe me. There will be those who will plead and say, Oh, touch me, touch me. It is not my touch, it is his touch. Know that. That's one thing I can promise you. There's one thing that I know about the slain power of the Holy Spirit. It is not in my touch. It is not Catherine Kuhlman. It's the supernatural power of the Holy Ghost. And the very thing that will happen in this great auditorium, in this building today, happened to Paul not very far from this building. <laughs> I give you a praise that the power of the Holy Ghost to go through this body. Just a very sharp distance from this building one day. That's what happened to Paul on the road out here. That's exactly what happened to Paul on the road out here. Paul on the road to Damascus. Think of it, this is so wonderful. We give you honor, we give you praise, we give you glory. I know the power of the Holy Ghost is on this. Is there no pain there? Move it up and down. Move it up and down. And as Paul on the road to Damascus, something happened, something glorious happened. Suddenly he was slain by the power of the Holy Ghost and he found himself prostrate on the ground. Some of you may have walked on the very same spot where the Holy Spirit did say Paul. And I believe in that a moment if any one of us would have come to him and would have said, what happened? on the ground what happened he thinks he would have gotten up and looked at us and would have said it was wonderful I don't understand what happened I don't know what happened but it was a glorious experience put, your, put, your, put it up now Swing that arm now, just as hard as you can. Give her a great big God bless her. In the car wreck, I had a broken back and a broken neck and a broken leg. This, how, long, how long ago was this that? This was in 1968. And what has happened since? And since then, um, I've had extreme pain in my right arm and in my shoulder. And though my neck and my back and my leg got all right, this, all the ligaments were pulled loose from the back of my spine down into my arm. And I lost all the power in this arm to where I have only five pound pressures all the time and was in pain. If you see the dark circles under my eyes from not being able to sleep from pain. At all time power. Restoration. This is not a day of revival. He's restoring the fruits and the gifts again. The fruits of... Honey, you'll never be able to stand on your feet. But uh, when she pointed up in the balcony for me, <laughs> Jesus healed me in a moment. And, um, and now what? No pain. I'm completely healed. I'm, I'm that was two days ago. Two days ago, yes. You're still with no pain. No pain. Whatsoever. No pain. Praise the Lord. Catherine Coleman's ministry.
are expanded quite rapidly through the medium of television and radio. Every day on the radio, she'd come on asking people, have you been waiting for me? Then every Sunday morning, she had her 30-minute CBS religious program, as they called it, where she had her show called I Believe in Miracles. She had her beautiful gowns made. She'd go out to the CBS studio in Hollywood and come on the set. And people out there in the studio world and the Hollywood world always was intrigued about Catherine Kuhlman. People would say that she's on the set. They could feel her come in on the, on the studio set, come in on the, into the buildings. They would say, ah, Catherine's here. That woman's here. I've talked to some of the ones that are saved now. And they say, you could feel her coming. You can feel her going. She carried something with her. I remember hearing the story about Catherine Kuhlman before they begin to give her a private entrance and exit in the Pittsburgh airport. She come in like everybody else did, and since she was quite known in Pittsburgh, people come up and say, Miss Kuhlman, would you pray for me? Catherine, would you pray for me? And she'd start praying for people as she was heading to the gate to get on her plane to go to the next miracle service, and she'd leave a row or a line of bodies that were slain out on the floor, and the janitors and the police would come by and say, oh, what happened to these people? Did somebody gas them? Is there a poison gas in the airport? And they'd have emergency runs, and they figured out Catherine Kuhlman had just walked through the airport and left about 15 people laid out on the airport floor. The people were coming by, getting off planes, saying, what's wrong with these people? So they had to give her a new entrance, a new exit, because of all the, the clamoring to get to her. Catherine Kuhlman said she'd walk back and forth behind the curtain of the miracle services, where she would die a thousand deaths. That's where she would try to empty herself, she said, because she knew that people were coming to her meetings. People would come to her meetings with, and with the last hope that if Miss Kuhlman could not help them, they were going to die. They were going to see death early. They were not going to be able to see their children grow up and be able to enjoy their grandchildren. And she knew that, and she knew she had nothing to give them. All she was was a yielded vessel, like she'd said in that clip you just saw. It's not golden vessels. It's not silver vessels. It's yielded vessels that he needs. And she did her best to yield and to point everybody to him. Miss Kuhlman died in February of 1976 in Tulsa, Oklahoma, of a of a heart condition. She'd preached every month uh, for many years in the Shrine Auditorium in Los Angeles as well as her services there in Pennsylvania. People would line up for hours in the morning and when the doors would open they would run into the building. Sometimes I wonder if people who open the door, do they not need healing after they'd open the door because the folks would run like they're in a marathon race to get those seats. And she'd be in a service of four or five hours and she'd say, I didn't get tired. I had nothing to do with it. All I was was just standing there interpreting, in other words, what God was doing to the people, calling people out with the word of knowledge and word of wisdom, and they were getting healed and getting filled with the Holy Spirit. Before she passed away, she had a wonderful service that the mayor of Las Vegas had invited her to come. And the mayor called it the Catherine Kuhlman Day. And Catherine Kuhlman came with her choirs and all of the things that you see in these clips and a whole lot more. And he shut down everything he could, the, uh, the casinos, all the, the government buildings, and focused on Catherine Kuhlman coming to Sin City. And she had tremendous miracles. Thousands of people got saved in that particular meeting there in Las Vegas. She went to El Paso, Minneapolis. She was in St. Louis. She went up to New York. She went to West Palm Beach, Florida. She went to Miami. She went so many places. Her schedule was such a packed schedule toward the end of her life that really nobody could really keep up with that kind of schedule. But she probably knew her life was coming to an end. When she finally got to the place where she could no longer preach, she collapsed actually behind uh, the Shrine Auditorium curtain there after that service, and they rushed her to Tulsa to see the, the special heart section there at St. John's Hospital. And she had Oral Roberts, Roberts come to pray for her. And when they came to pray for her, she said to them, no, don't pray for me, and point it up, I'm going to go to heaven. Oral Roberts told me, he said, I knew the power of God to heal. It was present to make her whole, but she'd made her choice, and she went on to be with the Lord that day. Oral Roberts had the privilege of speaking at her funeral and giving the great accolades, and there'd be no one else like Catherine Kuhlman. I'd have to say, in all the preachers I've seen and been around, there's only been one Miss Kuhlman. One of my great quotes of Miss Kuhlman is this one, the last one that I read when she was at Oral Roberts University Chapel. The world has called me a fool for believing in someone I've never seen, but I know exactly what I'm going to say when I see him face to face. I tried. The way I'm going to end this segment here is I'm going to let you see one of the great altar calls of Catherine Kuhlman when she's ending her service and she says, um, come to Jesus. Would you come to Jesus? And the thousands run forward. How many of you watching me were brought to the Lord by Miss Kuhlman, either by television or by radio or by one of those live services? We're so thankful to God that a person like Catherine Kuhlman lived and walked this earth. And we miss Catherine Kuhlman and we say one day we'll see her again and tell her face to face 
we thank you for the price you paid and the ministry that you gave to us. from death unto life. The Holy Spirit, your Spirit, softly in the Spirit, sing it Alleluia. Hold hands up, lift the door, and just sing it. We want you every week to come back and be with us. We want you to know that we're here to bless you. We're here to help change you. We're here to help you make you an end-time warrior that's not afraid of anything, that's ready to invade everything and do what God's called us to do in these last days. Please, when you write, send your prayer request in. Also, you may want to know more information about the Bible School that we have in Southern California. So make sure you say, send me the Bible School information or look it up on the website and have all the information about it. Or if you're in Southern California, you're flying through Los Angeles, we're about an hour south of Los Angeles.
Angeles Airport in the city called Irvine. We'd love to have you on a Sunday morning or a Tuesday night, or you can just come any time of the week and come in and visit the Bible School and sit in some of the classes. Also, if you want more information about where I may be speaking, I may be in your area and you may not know it, so make sure you look it up on the website or when you're requesting the tape series here and the special offer with the book, make sure you say, send me Robert's itinerary, or just call and we'll tell you where I'll be and we'll hope to see you there. We hope to see you next week as well, too. Have a wonderful day.